If you'll open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 9, 1 Kings chapter 9, we continue our look at the kings as we're doing on Wednesday evening. Last week, this week, and next week, we're going to look at topics that pertain to Solomon. And so this morning, we think about covenant reality as God is certainly in a covenant relationship with his people, and he's in a covenant relationship with Solomon because he's the heir of David, and God had promised David that he would have an heir on the throne, and we'll hear about that in this passage. 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 1. This is the word of God. When Solomon had finished building the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had achieved all he had desired to do, the Lord appeared to him a second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. The Lord said to him, I have heard the prayer and plea you have made before me. I have consecrated this temple which you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, if you walk before me in integrity of heart and uprightness as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever. As I promised David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. But if you or your sons turn away from me and do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. Israel will then become a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. And though this temple is now imposing, all who pass by will be appalled and will scoff and say, Why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? And people will answer, because they have forsaken the Lord their God who brought their fathers out of Egypt and have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. That is why the Lord brought all this disaster on them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It was the prophet Amos who posed that fundamental question about relationships, especially about a relationship between God and his people, said, can two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Can two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Throughout the Bible, God's relationship with his people was based upon covenants he had made. A covenant he made with Abraham, a covenant he made with Moses, then with David. We even see Jesus talking about the new covenant. Wherein I think the proper interpretation would be that new covenant is all those covenants, the truths and realities that were seen there are renewed and fulfilled in Jesus. He says here is the new covenant that I am the fulfillment of all these things, the very redemption, the salvation of God's people. What the Bible teaches is that a covenant relationship with God, which every Christian has through Jesus, is a relationship that includes mutual responsibility and accountability. There are things that God has promised to us and we can hold him accountable. There are things he requires of us, and he can hold us accountable. And that brings us to our text this morning. God had promised David that he would have an heir to sit on his throne. God was pleased with David. David wasn't perfect, but his heart never turned from his God. Oh, he disobeyed God. But he never sought other gods. When he was convicted of his sin, where did he turn? He turned to God and said, Against thee and thee only have I sinned. And because of David's heart for God, God was pleased and said, David, I will bless you by giving you an heir who will sit on your throne forever. 
God reminded Solomon of this covenant promise to his father David that he was fulfilling as he sat on the throne. And he renewed that and said it will be true for you and your heirs if, like David, you follow me wholeheartedly, keeping my commands. As Christians, we too are in a covenant relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are responsible and accountable. In our day, we hear lots about what God will do for us and very little about our responsibility to him and the relationship. We are responsible and accountable for how we live, the choices we make. First thing I want us to do this morning is just quickly look at the context in which the passage occurs and then look at what we learn. Solomon had reached the high point of his reign. That's when God appears to him this second time. His throne has been secured and he reigns in peace. He is powerful economically, militarily. These great building projects that he's just completed are symbols of his power and the power of his kingdom. The temple complex had been completed and verse 1 tells us he had achieved all he desired to do. And I think in the context we have to understand that he completed everything he desired to do in that temple complex. All that was settled and established. Now he could look outward. And he did. He was an incredible builder. God had given him wisdom, power, and wealth. And you notice then God appears a second time. And what does God do? He reminds Solomon of God's past faithfulness. He said, I've been faithful to your father David. You are living proof of that. I have been faithful to you. Look around you. I have established your throne. You ask me for wisdom. I have given you wisdom such as no one on this planet has ever had or ever will have. In addition to that wisdom, I have given you wealth and power and fame. And he reminds Solomon, if you are faithful to me, I will fulfill in you and your sons what I promised to your father David. But if not, you will be responsible. From time to time, God reminds us of his covenant faithfulness. And we need to remember God's goodness to us. We need to be able to speak to that. We need to be able to speak of those things to our children and our grandchildren so they hear from our lips how good God has been to us. But in that, we also need to remember our covenant responsibilities. God was once again reminding Solomon of the terms of his covenant. And that brings us to verses 3 through 9, where we see covenant reality. God had answered Solomon's prayer that this temple he had built would be a focal point, a special place. So that when his people disobeyed him and were judged for their sin, sometimes scattered and oppressed throughout the earth, that if they would humble themselves, turn back to the temple, look there, meaning that they were looking to their God. That's what it meant. There was no magic in facing Jerusalem. It was a reminder to look back to their covenant God, repent of their wickedness, and pray for his mercy and restoration. And God said, Solomon, that's what you prayed for. And that's what I will do. Do you ever pray for the peace of Jerusalem? The psalmist says to, God says he will never ever turn his eye away from them, even when they were trampled for a thousand years. I believe God still had his eye on Jerusalem. 
God is as good as his word. Now we don't look to Jerusalem, we look up to behold our God, our Christ, seated on his throne. Look to God. Solomon, I have heard you. And I will bless you and your people if you are obedient. And when I read this passage, I thought about Moses. You remember Moses in Deuteronomy before the children of Israel entered the promised land? I know that was a few years ago we studied that on Wednesday night, but shake up the little gray cells and maybe you'll remember and he says, when you go into the land, you take half the people and go up this mountain. You take the other half and go up this mountain. And from this mountain, you declare the blessings of the covenant. And from this mountain, you declare the curses of the covenant. That if you follow me, are faithful to me, you will live in these blessings. But if you don't, you will experience the cursings that come. So in verses 4 and 5, he reminds Solomon of the blessings of obedience. Verse 4, if you walk before me, how? With integrity of heart. Not just going through the motions, not jumping through the religious hoops, but serving God alone. And what was one of the tendencies of Israel? To serve other gods, the gods of the peoples around them. It's no different today. There is an allure and a pull that the gods of this world have. Watching a ball game yesterday between nodding off, which I do more than, never could understand why my dad did that, and now I know. But they showed some car, and I tried to forget it, because I'm not ever buying another new car. I don't want to have payments anymore. I just don't want that. But, oh, it was tempting. That car, I think, could eat for you if you just push the right button. It would just do all this stuff and had all these cameras that you could see all around. I said, you know, Mr. Gadget here likes the gadget, doesn't know how to work them, just likes to have them. I said, boy, wouldn't that be cool? And then I thought, get a grip. Do you know how much that car costs? Do you know what those payments would be? And I go, Ooh, thank you. I almost had a moment there. Car fever. That car fever will get you in debt now. I'm telling you. You young people don't believe all that stuff they tell you. Yeah, they're nice, but they cost. But isn't that how the world gets us? We catch car fever, house fever, husband fever, wife fever. And before long, we're following everything but God to serve the gods we've sold our souls to. Blessing comes from serving God alone. Totally committed that God, even when I fall, I will look up. You're it. I have no other God. And you've heard me say before, and you'll hear me say again, I don't have a plan B. If Jesus Christ is not the Savior, not my Savior, then I'm lost because I don't have any other plan. If the God of Holy Scripture is not the God who is, then I am lost because I believe this book. I believe the God of this book. And though I may fail him, he is the only God I know. And I want to be like David in that. I want to be wholehearted. Like Joshua and Caleb who wholeheartedly followed the Lord when the ten spies gave the bad report. God says if you do that, verse 5, then. You notice that if then Verse 4, if, verse 5, then, then I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever. And then in verses 6 through 9, you see the cursings of disobedience. Here are the blessings of obedience. Here are the cursings of disobedience. Verse 6, 
But if you or your sons turn away from me, if you break my covenant by failing to wholeheartedly follow me, you begin to serve other gods. You begin to dabble with the religions of the peoples around you. You begin to grow soft in your commitment to me. There will be consequences. I will hold you accountable. In verse 7, then I will cut off Israel from the land. The nation itself would suffer the consequences because, you see, king and nation were wed together in this covenant relationship. The kings of Israel were always to be first and foremost the spiritual leaders of the people. We see them as political leaders only, and that's a terrible, terrible mistake. As you're reading your assignments through the kings, bear in mind that these kings were accountable to God first to lead the people to him, not to be their governmental head. That was secondary. And as you read the stories of the kings, you see that as the king went, soon the nation went. A wicked king soon led a wicked nation. You say, well, preacher, we don't have a king. No, we sure don't, but the principle remains. We have a lot of wicked churches because we've got a lot of wicked pastors in the pulpit who don't preach the word of God, they preach what their people want to hear. They preach what society tells them to preach because it's acceptable. And so we walk out of church and we've had a performance with a big band and lights and a good time was had by all. And we march like lemmings straight to hell. Just like Israel of old. When their kings led them into apostasy Saying, oh, this is how you worship God now. The way your grandparents did, that's old fuddy-duddy stuff. God is cool. I never read that in the scripture. I read he's holy. I read he's merciful. I read he's faithful. But I don't read he's cool. He doesn't change with the whims of the culture. That's why we can depend on him. He doesn't change with the whims of my emotion. Some mornings I wake up and I don't feel human, much less Christian. Does that change God? No. If it did, I'm in trouble. And so are you if you listen to what I say. And yet we have preachers who tell people exactly what they want to hear and say that sin is right and godliness is wrong. And where are they leading their people? Straight to hell. And we wonder why our church is empty out. Because if you're like me, if you hear that, well, hey, we're all saved anyway. And we're all good old boys and good old girls. And it really doesn't matter what we do. God is love and he good. Then why am I going to get up and go to church on Sunday morning? There's got to be more to it than that. I go because I love God. Because I love his people. And I ain't that good. He is. He's done a work in me. I don't like crowds. You know that. The only crowd I like is when the church is full and I can preach my heart out and slip away. But you can't do that. You got to shake hands. But y'all have been so nice, I don't, I'm not afraid to go to the front door these days. <clears throat> Israel, the northern kingdom, after the division, they had not one godly king. Not one king like David. And they never, ever had revival in the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom, depending on what scholar you read, had six or eight. And there were times of revival and renewal and blessing. When the hand of God was at work because his people, believing his covenant promise, said, we have sinned against you, forgive us. 
and he was merciful and forgave and began to work in their midst. And God says, one of these days, I will destroy you because you will turn your back on me. And when that happens, that was unthinkable at this time. He says, when it happens and people say, why? Why is that temple destroyed? Why is Jerusalem in ruin? Then the people will say, because they forsook their God and worshipped other gods. And he did what he promised. He judged them. You see, Jesus Christ is the descendant of David, the king and head of his church. What God promised to David has come to pass. He has an heir on the throne. Why do you think the genealogies in Matthew and Luke are so important? We read them, and I, if you're like me, for years I've read them and said, oh Lord, I know they're important, but I don't have a clue why. And you muddle through all those names and people say, Preacher, I just can't read that. I just can't read. I said, read it anyway. I don't under read it anyway. And then you study and the light goes on. You know why? Because they're tracing Jesus' lineage. Because he is the Christ of God. He is the one who fulfills the Davidic covenant. He will ever sit on the throne of David, rule over God's people. And he will bring in blessings Showers of blessings, the, prom the prophet says. All these things are fulfilled in Jesus. The Passover lamb. Those lambs that bleated and cried and were slaughtered to cover the sins of God's faithful. Paul says our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. The writer of Hebrews says... Our great high priest has entered once for all into the most holy place with his own blood and he came out and sat down. It's finished. Redemption is complete for Christ has secured our redemption with his own blood. And he says, follow me. Follow me. I was telling my mom yesterday and telling Kay last night, I said, I'm more and more convinced that we in the American church have only preached half the gospel. We tell people, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you come and you say a prayer, and we give you your card, and you think you're free. That's not biblical redemption. Biblical redemption is when you are convinced and convicted of your sin by the Holy Spirit. You say, God, you're right. I have nothing to offer you. I'm lost and undone. Save me. And you look to the cross believing that Jesus' blood and righteousness is the only hope for you. You say, I don't understand it. Oh, you don't have to. Jesus, save me. But in that... You're determined to walk with him, not take his goodies and run. You see, if you follow Christ, you've made a commitment to do just that. Walk with him in that relationship. What if you married someone and they left the altar and you never saw them again? Wouldn't be much of a relationship, would it? It might be a legal, technical marriage. You might have your name on somebody's church roll, but you're not in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And that's what scares me because I see people who live as though they don't know Jesus Christ. They live as though they're totally oblivious to the truths and the word of God. And then you talk to them about their relationship with Christ. Hey, I got my card. I'm a church member so-and-so. But you never go. You live like that. That doesn't matter. Oh, yes, it does. Because you see, how you live is a clear indication of who you love.
You know how I know you love one another? Because the way you treat one another. Isn't that how our spouses know we love them? Oh yeah, because we brag on them and kiss them and pat them on the back. Yeah, that's important. But they know it because we do the things that love does when it's not convenient and it's not what we want to do. When we accept our responsibilities and we commit to each other to do what love does, then we know we're in a meaningful relationship. Now what about you? You see, you, you all look good to me. You, I can't see through, but the Holy Spirit sees your heart. What about you? Is the Holy Spirit saying, hey, we need to talk? Because you're mine. But you've been making some choices that don't lead you to me. We need to talk. It may be that you'd say, Preacher, I've been in church all my life, but you're right. I know about him, but I don't know him. No better day than today. Wherever you are, whenever. As I've told you, I love reading about Chuck Colson's conversion. He's a God who had been working on him, working on him, and he pulled off the interstate there in D.C. and bowed his head and said, I give up, save me. And you know the rest of the story. Maybe in the middle of the night, it may be tomorrow at work that you bow your head and say, God, save me. That's okay. And then some of you, by God's grace, you'd say, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not where I was. God's been good. Then you just keep on keeping on. You keep on crying to the Holy Spirit to give you grace and help you. You keep delighting in him and do the next right thing. He will bless you with himself. I don't know where you are. But all of us need Jesus. All of us need to remember our covenant responsibilities. And you know the wonderful thing is when I find myself really striving to please God, he usually says, would you knock it off? Just walk with me. Just walk with me. You know, some of your kids, I know they're your kids if I never met them before because I know you and they act like you. Their mannerisms and expressions are like yours. The religious leaders took note of the disciples. They said, these men have been with Jesus. They dealt with Jesus. They knew what he was like. and said, doggone, they're just like him because they'd been with him. May we walk with him so that our world will say that about us. Well, all I know is that they, they just look like Jesus to me. Yes. May it ever be so. Amen.